Hello, I'd like to say good morning to you, uh, class. Uh, when we last met, we were discussing the method of justification here in chapter 10 of the book of Romans. And uh, we're going to move on now uh, to chapter number 11, and we're going to be starting out with talking about God's chosen people. But as I always like to do, let's, let's go to the Lord and ask him to help us do this in a manner that will be uh, pleasing to him and beneficial for us. Our Father, I thank you again for the awesome opportunity of being able to teach this class, this book, and this wonderful book of Romans that uh, you allow, you use Apostle Paul to write so that we might know about the operation of the church the way that it should be done according to your will, and that we would learn the other doctrines that we need to learn. And Lord, we just pray we'd place these things in our hearts and minds that we can use them to further this wonderful cause of Christ. And Father, I just pray that you'd lead God and direct us. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Now, as we look to chapter number 11, God's chosen people, uh, we, we must uh, look at this in the sense that Paul wrote it. He said, I say then, hath God cast away his people? And then again, we've seen this term several times. It, the answer was, God forbid. In other words, this is expressing that absolute denial that God would not do that. He, he would not cast away his people. And those people that Paul are talking about right here is a people that he's a part of, the Israelites. And he said, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2, he said, God hath not cast away his people. He has not cast away the Israelites, which he foreknew, uh, chose beforehand. What? Ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah? We see that word what, W-O-T. It means understand you not. Don't you understand what the scripture uh, saith of Elijah? How he maketh uh, intercession uh, to God against Israel. In other words, he said, The Lord, uh, they have killed thy prophets and digged down thine altars. Uh, well, let's look uh, at, at the rest of that verse. And I am left alone, and they seek my life. Uh, look at verse 4. He says, But what saith the answer of God unto uh, him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You see, we need to look right here, and, and we need to never feel that we are alone. You see, when we look at this, and, and, and he was, he was uh, talking about, uh, you know, that Elijah was, that uh, he was all alone, you know. He didn't have anybody to help him to fight against these these uh, people and uh, these enemies and, and they were after his life and God said to him you know I've reserved uh, to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal in other words I have 7,000 people that believe in me just like you do they're not enemies of yours uh, they're, they're friends of yours and, and when we feel like we're left alone we need to understand there are many people even though we talk about the remnant in, in, the, in, in, in the, the comparison of the many people that have been born, there are many people still that are on our side, that are fighting with us against the wiles of Satan and the devil, and, and, and we're not alone. And God let him know, you know, you're not alone. And verse number five, he says, even so, then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. You see, I mentioned that word already before we got to this verse, and it's one of my favorite terms, not that I like the fact that maybe there aren't as many people as many people think that are saved, but I, I like the fact that there are still a few remaining that are faithful to God. I, I like the fact that, that I live in a country that we founded on trusting in God, and though this country has turned and it's headed in the wrong direction 
away from following God, we still have that remnant of people, I believe, that are still faithful to that. They still trust in God. And I believe that the reason that we are still such a blessed nation is because of this remnant of people, this few remaining people that according to the election of grace, the choice of grace, they accepted Jesus Christ. They had that choice. They did. Uh, I believe that because of this grace, this absolute freeness of the loving kindness of God to man, I, I think we ought to always be ready to understand it's not anything that we were able to do other than accept Jesus Christ by our own free will that could have ever got us into heaven, will ever get us into heaven. And we need to, to push that point across that that election is that choice. I chose Jesus Christ. You see, again, as I look out among you and I, I think about you as students of the Word of God and, and some young preachers that are going to be going out here and preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, I think about the fact that we ought to push across and be very uh, ready at all times to let people know it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about Jesus Christ. That's one of my favorite things to say because I know if it were not for the grace of God, I would not be in the position I'm in right now. I would not be headed to heaven, but I would be headed to a devil's hell uh, facing eternity separated from God. In verse number six, and if by grace, then it, is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. You know, you think about Peter saying that sometimes the Apostle Paul's words were hard to understand. Uh, this really isn't that hard to understand. He says, and if it, if it by grace, uh, then it is no more of works. In other words, there is nothing that you and I have the capabilities or the abilities to do as far as the activities in our everyday living of life, the performances that we live, that we could ever be saved. Uh, he said, in other words, grace, uh, that unearned, that unmerited favor of God is no more grace. You see, if you're saved by, by works, then you don't have that unearned, unmerited, you would earn that. If you were to be able to be good enough to go to heaven, that means you would have an earned ticket to heaven. And it means that Jesus Christ would have came and he would have died on the cross for absolutely no reason because we could have done it on our own. But we cannot. We will never be able to. We were never able to. Uh, he says, other words, is, uh, other words, grace, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. You see, it's really not that hard to understand. It is no more unearned favor, you know. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see, if you can work for it, you don't need the grace for it. If you get it by grace and can't get it by works, there's no use trying to work for it. Amen? I hope you understand that. But the thing that I'd like to, to put in here right now, that there's an opportunity to do that, is the fact that once you get saved, you do what is called work out of your salvation. You see, after we're, we're saved, we're not expected to sit back and do nothing, but we're expected by God to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. We're to go out and do the good works so that people can see Jesus Christ in us and that we might be those people that are effective in our testimony to trying to lead them to Christ. Uh, verse number 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh, for but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Oh, what then? There we go with another question. Uh, hath, Israel hath not obtained, or obtained, or gained, or achieved that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained and uh, the rest were blinded. You see, we have so many people today that are blinded. They are blinded by untruth. We have the true word of God, and it is beyond me why that people choose to believe a lie 
when they have the truth. But there are many people that choose to believe a lie. They are hardened. Uh, their minds are hardened. Uh, I once heard this said, uh, that there are some people that you'll just have to outlive because even God will not be able to change their minds because they won't allow him to. You see, I've, I've begun to learn after many years of frustration with people that uh, it is not our responsibility to change anybody's mind, but it's our responsibility to preach the glorious gospel as it is to people as they are and allow the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work. And verse number eight, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. He has literally uh, given them that spirit, that, uh, that moral uh, quality, uh, and uh, and thinking, he he's literally allowed them to go to sleep. You see, he's literally allowed them to almost like we're talking about before many times in studies of the scales being on their eyes, where that they're blinded. You know, we just finished a verse where it talked about them being blinded, and and they they just they're still. They're wrong, they're distressed from the guilt of their past wrongs, and that they, he says, he has given them into slumber, actually to sleep, where that they do not see, they do not hear, and to this day, that's a sad thing. And we need to realize that there is a time when God will withdraw the Spirit of God from our, from us, from, from literally uh, letting us know, convicting those that are without Christ, you can only turn down God so many times. And I believe we need to think this way. We need to not count on another chance. You know, God is merciful, but how many chances have we already had? How many chances have you had and you've not heard? You've not been able to see the truth. You've been allowed to put, be put to sleep literally in the right train of thought towards accepting the plan of salvation. Verse number nine, and David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. You know, again, it's very sad that people will get to the point in their life where they have constantly rejected uh, the, the truth of the word of God and that, that, that they are being paid uh, that payment of sin because of the stumbling block that they have set their course of sin and that has led them up to the point where they no longer uh, can even hear or see the truth. Now let's look on to verse number 10 where Paul said, Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. You see, again, as, as, as I talk about often when I'm, when I'm uh, teaching the Word of God, how that it's repetitious. And right here in just the last few verses, we've seen this where, where their, their eyes have gotten to the point and the condition that they're blinded. They cannot see because of their, their continuing rejection of the truth. He says, let their eyes be darkened, obscured, literally hidden from understanding. Isn't that a sad commentary that they had reached that point through that total often and continual rejection of the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of the Word of God. And he says in, that they may not see and bow down their back always. In verse 11 he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Again, we see this term, God forbid, but rather through their fall, uh, through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Uh, I told you we would be getting ahead to that. We would be talking more about that benefit that was given to the Gentiles through the rejection of the Jews. In verse 11 where he says, I say then, 
Have they stumbled? Literally, have they erred that they should fall? Uh, he said, God forbid. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, but rather, uh, rather, now take a look at that word, rather through their fall, uh, their their uh, rejection, their the they're just not accepting it. It's come unto the Gentiles uh, for to provoke them to jealousy. Uh, let's look at that that that, that uh, rivalry that we know so much about in this day and time. You know, there's much jealousy in the world, and and that jealousy becomes of a, a lot of times of what someone else has acquired that you haven't gotten and you become jealous over that. He said he did this to provoke them to jealousy. Literally to do that to, uh, to uh, uh, this, this race of mankind, these Gentiles, that he would work that jealousy through them. Now verse 12, Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Whoa, what a question. He says, now if the fall of them that be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the, the correction, the riches uh, of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? How much more their completeness? Uh, this, this valuable bestowment that the fullest of the richest of the glory of God in eternal life. Uh, how much more their fullness. May God bless you is my prayer.